Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us for today's expert talk, The Million Dollar Independent Professional. So let me introduce our speakers today. Um, so leading the conversation today is Elaine Pafault, who is a Forbes senior contributor and independent journalist. She's also the author of a million dollar one person business, as well as a few other books, if I'm not mistaken. And she'll be leading the discussion today with Evan Fisher, who may be a familiar face for those that have been uh, some of our previous events. He is the founder and CEO of Unicorn Capital. He is also a freelance pitch deck expert, and he's a creator of a, a fantastic YouTube channel that I highly recommend you check out. It is the Freelance MVP. And Evan, if you wouldn't mind, drop a drop a link or a hashtag in there so that people can find that later. Very okay. engaging. <laughs> and then we're fortunate enough to be joined today by the App Evolve Managing Partners. We have Jason Martin and Patrick Falvey. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, App Evolve is a custom software development agency that helps businesses increase efficiency through modern technology. And uh, these two uh, started off by building a top-rated multi-million dollar agency on Upwork. And I am honestly fascinated to hear more about that. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it to Elaine to guide our conversation. Throughout the conversation, I will be monitoring the chat and the q and I'll go ahead and communicate there. But again, we'll pause for Q&A in a bit. So thank you very much. Elaine, on to you. Well, well, thank you so much, Will. And thank you, everyone, for coming. I feel a little bit choked up seeing all these names in the chat from all over the world, all these people on this shared journey of entrepreneurship, freelancing, building a business, all simultaneously coming together. So thank you so much. And thank you for taking this time to tune in and work on your business. You should give yourselves a pat on the back for taking the time for professional development because many people really don't do that. And that is one of the hallmarks of people that build the seven figure businesses. Um, I'm Elaine Pofeld. I'm the author of the Million Dollar One Person Business and Tiny Business Big Money. And I was a senior editor at Fortune Small Business 15 years ago when I decided to start my own freelancing business. I have four children and my reason was was family. Everybody here on this call has different reasons for choosing freelancing. For some, it's opportunity. For some, it's flexibility to go mountain biking. Um, for some, it's other things. Um, but we've all come together with this shared passion. I'd like to ask Evan and then uh, Jason and Patrick to give us a quick update on what you've been doing the last couple of years. We have a broad overview of what you've been up to, but I know um, with these million dollar seven figure businesses, they never stay static. So maybe one or two lines each, and then we'll dive into the questions. Evan. Um, yeah, thanks, Elaine. Uh, everybody, first off, super excited to be here and uh, alongside some pretty spectacular people, if I'm honest. Uh, very much in a nutshell, my uh, background is in uh, is in the financial services and business consulting space. Uh, me and my company Unicorn help uh, founders, entrepreneurs, business owners who are going out to raise at least five million, ten million, sometimes fifty, a hundred, two hundred fifty million uh, to package up their business to go out and be effective in front of investors. Uh, so it's a little bit more than just a simple uh, pitch deck, uh, but that's sort of what got me started on on Upwork. And now there's, well, <laughs> there's a YouTube channel and a lot more to talk about, but I will yield <laughs> the remainder of my time <laughs> to the guys. I, uh, Evan, just it, um, for the benefit of folks who are not in the financial world, what, what does Unicorn refer to? Uh, you, a unicorn is a business that's raised a um, has built their business to a billion dollar valuation. Uh, so, for example, uh, Uber would be a good example of of a unicorn. And so, we make unicorns. It's exciting because he's on the front lines of a lot of the companies that you read about in the in the headlines, behind the scenes, but on the front lines. And then, oh yeah. Um, I don't know, Jason or Patrick, would one of you like to take, uh, you know, what App Evolve has been up to? Because every time I talk to you two, something new is happening. Yeah, certainly. Hey, Elaine. Um, Will, thank you very much for the introduction. Very happy to be a part of this panel. Um, Elaine, great to see you as always. You know, you we've known you for a while now, and it's always good to see your face. And, you know, we're very grateful to share the stage with Evan as well. Um, but yeah, a lot of exciting things going on with App Evolve. Um, like you said, I mean, we're we're seeing constant growth. We're up to 
over 50 team members right now. Um, we have a lot of freelancers on the team, but I would say over 30 team members are employees now, all because, and, and that was catapulted by Upwork, which, um, you know, which, which we love and uh, we love sharing our story about Upwork and how we grew on Upwork. And so we have multinational offices now with employees in those, in those offices. And so, yeah, very exciting times. I feel like, you know, we're growing every year um every week uh so yeah it's been an exciting journey and um one that we're very excited to continue so we can't we can't wait to hear more about it um evan tell us a little bit about how you went into business for yourself you were on the corporate track you were if i remember correctly working at an investment bank in switzerland in the middle of this glamorous career uh, you learning some of the things you do now, like slide decks and uh, writing business plans, but then you decided to go on your own. Tell us a little bit about what brought that about. Oh, that was that was much more of a um, uh, a, a a a force than uh, something that you know was like an an active decision of how I got started uh, freelancing. So basically. Uh, Yes, I wasn't in, in an investment bank uh, in Switzerland, um, but ended up uh, leaving that company doing like a little bit of, let's call it broken consulting, uh, just for uh, somebody that I had worked with previously. Uh, and that ended up in job evaporation. And so I was like, okay, got to figure out what are we going to do next? And, and how do we, uh, how do we provide for for my family at that time. Uh, so I, when I got started on Upwork, I had literally $10 and 21 cents in the bank. And it was like, you got to find a solution. Cause I had a little, you know, couple months old daughter and, uh, and wife to take care of. And, it was, and at that point in time, I was in Spain where I just, there was no prospect of anything as far as like, you know, permanent full-time employment. So it was figured out. Uh, and, uh, I, came across Upwork. Uh, I always have to give a big shout out to my mom uh, for mentioning it to me. And uh, from there, uh, things, you know, sort of snowballed. Uh, it was not an easy journey, but we'll, we'll talk more about that, I'm sure. I, lo I love that motto of figure it out, right? Because that's what we do when we're self-employed is we, there's no instruction manual, but somehow we, we do figure it out. And, and it, I think it gives us all confidence when we get through those periods. Uh, Jason and Patrick were really good friends. If I um, understood correctly, they worked together at a software startup that was um, doing apps for sales. Oh, well, doing apps, and you noticed there were not apps that you dreamed of for Salesforce, and you started coming up with ideas and went out on your own. They're also ultra marathoners. They make me feel lazy. If I go for a three mile run, they go for like hundred mile runs. <laughs> they have young too. I don't know how they do it all. Not 100. Tell us a little bit about that decision to, to trust your own instincts and go out on your own. Definitely. Yeah, uh, just real quick, I like one of my, you know, one of my favorite quotes, I and I heard it a long time ago, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but it was from Will Smith, where he says, you know, like a plan B just distracts from your plan A. And, and, and you, you know, it's just that aggressive mentality of just going for, you know, have that tunnel vision of what you want and going for it and don't let any other plan B's or anything else, you know, and that's, you know, that mentality isn't for everybody. But um, that was definitely one that, you know, like Evan, you know, Patrick and I were in that same position. So, um. yeah, very much so. It was, uh, I, I heard actually the exact same thing. And I, it's like one of those things, that, like the quote, it's like, I, I don't know where I can place it, but that exact quote of, um, you only have to, you only have a plan A and you got to go after that plan A, plan A being the only plan, uh, because otherwise you're going to achieve nothing. But, if you stick to the plan A and plan and make plan A work, yep, then you're going to be successful. So, yeah. So, so I, I'm I'm reading into this. The power of adrenaline is very important for starting a business. Um, when you kind of back yourself into a corner and you, and you have to make it work, a lot of people do. Um, so, how did you know you made the right decision? Maybe you can 
take us through, Patrick, do you remember the early days of your business where yeah. you were experimenting and, you know, tell us a little, may, actually, maybe before you even get to that, let's talk a little bit about Upwork because I see in the chat questions are pouring in. Everybody wants to know, how do you build a profile that stands out on Upwork? What what can I do to bring in more business? So you all started your businesses on Upwork and um, I, I remember, speaking with you both, Patrick and Jason, about how you built a strong profile, things like getting professional headshots done and that sort of thing. Maybe yeah. you could talk a little bit about how you set yourself up for success. Definitely. Yeah. And, and first of all, a pleasure to be here and, and, and it's an honor to be in such great company and, and always a pleasure to see your face, Elaine. Um, but as far as, you know, how do you become successful on Upwork? You know, really making sure that the talent and the hard work and attention to detail that you possess and put into your work every day comes through in your profile, right? So like you said, professional headshots, making sure they're not pixelated, making sure you know, you're know you dressed nicely and, and that you're conveying the amount of professionalism that you bring to whatever industry and skills that you provide. Um, making sure that when you are applying to, to jobs on Upwork, you're, you're making sure that they, that you're not just copying and pasting your, your proposal, right? 90% of all proposals on Upwork are just copy pasted. And, a, and it's one so sad. Way, and it's so sad. Yeah, it's a, it's efficient. It gets a lot of, it gets, gets <laughs> your name out there. You, you apply to a lot of jobs, but it's very easily recognizable by anybody that's hiring on Upwork. So making right. sure you take the time to read through everything, um, you know, it, five extra 10 minutes to really understand what the client is looking for and how you can be, Best, best provide value to that client. Um, that's a that's a huge huge part of it as well. Um, we try to make sure that we are addressing specific. Of course, if they ask specific questions, making sure you're answering those questions in the in the proposal. If, but also trying to be creative with uh, providing examples of how you would implement a solution for that client, including that in your proposal as well. So making sure that you're professional, making sure that everything is personalized when you do apply to jobs and um, consistency as well. You know, like you, like you, ref, like everybody referenced earlier, I, I like, I like the quote, necessity is the mother of all invention. Right. Um, and, you know, when you, when you need to make something happen, it's a lot easier to make it happen rather than just wanting to make it happen. Right. So really applying that hard work and dedication that you have, for accomplishing your dream into the hiring process and upwork, making sure that you are you're you're hitting it hard. You're hitting the streets and you're, you know, you're getting out there, you know, the streets and upwork, right? You're getting out there and and finding every job that applies to your skill set and making sure that you're turning in a proposal, leaving no stone unturned. That's, yeah. that's my it's a lot of work, Patrick. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot, but it but it pays off. And uh, you know, a little bit extra onto uh, you know, what we've been doing and also the plan A, plan B is, you know, App Evolves in its seventh year of business now. And so we've come a long way and, you know, Upwork really helped build that. It, it built the office behind me. Um, and we're, we're now getting to a point where, like Jason said, we're growing rapidly. We'll probably have a team of 70 people by the end of the year. We can't hire fast enough. And um, we actually are starting, starting to go into plan B and C now where we're creating other products. We have a, we have a couple of different products that we expect to be uh, used by clients live within within Q1 of 2023. Um, but yeah, the hard work pays off. It really that's does. So, that, that's yeah. inspiring to hear because one thing I know about freelancers is they are very hard workers. Mm -hmm. And we've got over 500 of them uh... still pouring in. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, who are very hard working, at, you know, who will do that. They'll go out and apply to every job that applies to their skill set. Evan, one of the things that I learned from you was how carefully you selected the niche in which you would market yourself. Now, you're a business writer and you could apply those skills to a lot of different areas. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how you studied the platform and the marketplace at large and found what you would specialize in and also how that evolved over time because I remember at one point you said maybe you should have been called Unicorn Pitch Decks and that came later in the process of, of running the company. Yeah, it was, 
to to what Patrick was saying, it as you go along in in your upward journey, um, and uh, I would say probably you guys have seen this too. Uh, you start off just like throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks, and there's a whole host of things that you can do. But as time goes on, you sort of filter that down into okay, what should I do? What um, where is my best fit? Where is there, you know, consistent enough projects where I can start to create a process around things, start to create um, a, a a methodology around things that I can get consistent results for for clients and ultimately give them a really I call it the wow experience, right? Where somebody looks at the end result and says, "Wow, that was great!" Because when that happens. All good things come from that. Uh, come from that. That final state of I am incredibly happy with what it is that you, Mr. And Mrs. Freelancer, have done as a client. Right. Uh, so becoming a master of delivering that wow experience, it does start at step one of filtering for your clients and just because you're able to do something doesn't mean that you necessarily should be doing something. And that's something that you will, let's say, get more of a feel for as time goes on, as you do more projects, as you uh, start to find out which clients you're going to be the best fit with for a given service or product that you're going to deliver. Uh, and you start to narrow and narrow and narrow your client fit uh, to the point that, uh, I, like, I can rattle off what I'm targeting as far as clients, like, off the top of my head. It doesn't mean that that's going to apply for everybody, but I know that I know what I'm looking for. Even down to like the tiny little minute things, I've got the the customer avatar nailed, uh, and that is and very helpful. Just stop you there. Can you could you detail a couple of the little things that that you look for, um, and they they might be sort of intangibles. Oh yeah. Um, since I'm a book ghostwriter, and a lot of times my clients that can afford to outsource the whole book will have hobbies that I don't have, like private aviation or <laughs> yachting, things like that. That's just a reality. And and when I hear that, then I realize that's a client that can do that type of a project. They have the budget to do it. Um, do you have things like that? It doesn't necessarily have to be tried to budget, but in terms of what they're looking for and whether they will appreciate what you have to offer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So on budget, it's very simple and very easy in what I do as to like understanding, okay, does this person have the, have the budget to be working together? Are they a good fit from a budget perspective? Because I have full license and basically a requirement, a, a duty to ask, how much money have you raised thus far as a business? And if that is under a certain number, then it doesn't really make sense to work together unless there's some specific mitigating factors, which you know are, are very, very clearly presented. Like you've exited a business before, or uh, you have an extremely deep pocketed, very big investor but the business is just a little bit earlier stage in in this space. Um, um, just just so to dial back for a moment for people that aren't familiar with business fundraising, what Evan's documents are used to do is to help the clients make a pitch to potential investors who will buy a share of the business. And so he's saying if they haven't really raised much money now, they're unlikely to go the full uh, journey with him to becoming a unicorn, you know, to go to the biggest investors in the world. It just means that it might not be a fit quite yeah. yet. And so might it might be, the business might be a little bit too early stage, but coming to the intangibles, the intangibles are really where the, the, the fun happens uh, from my side. And I, I look for these uh, and have kind of developed a little mini system, if you will, of, how to figure out whether a client is going to be a good one for you, um, or at least for me. Uh, because as with many 
uh, and I imagine many people, you know, drop a, a thumbs up in the chat if you, the projects that you do require your clients to be at some level interactive or give you information or give provide feedback throughout the course of your work process. Um, it's a pretty common thing, like you're gonna go through iterations of things and you need a client to be interactive and helpful and uh, work with you as you know projects go on. And equally well, if a client doesn't, uh, if, if they just sort of either ghost you or are just not proactive and they wait a week before giving you any feedback, or you know any number of things that can happen when you ask for feedback and it doesn't come back you know in a, in a decent amount of time or that person just goes away or they don't follow directions or whatnot um, then that stalls out projects and that's not good for anybody it's not good for you not good for the client they don't get something that they like and you get a stalled project and potentially things can go off the rails so i look for that and i identify for that and filter for that before ever taking on in a, a, a client because if you if you filter only for clients that yes have money and because a lot of people have money but it doesn't mean that they're a good client yeah they but, can be difficult yeah right if you filter out people who are going to be difficult if you filter out those who are just not really going to take action when you when you um when you need them to in the course of a project, then you've eliminated actually most of your headaches throughout the course of that project. Add in a couple of other criteria for vetting. And if you've got people who are proactive, who yes, do have budget, who understand how serious this is and who are going to you know do what they need to do to contribute to get this job done, then you're in a pretty good spot as far as having successful projects that are going to be a blast for the client, great for you, and everybody's going to win with. So, my one of the things that that I will look for, um, you know, putting rubber to the road on that vetting process is if before we meet the first time, say Elaine, you and I want to you know work on a project together, and you're the potential client, and um, and we're going to hop on a Zoom tomorrow. Uh, maybe I send you something, just a, you know, quick little like video snippet. Hey, you know, check this out. It'll probably answer a lot of your questions before we jump on a call. Um, then we get on a call together. Uh, thumbs up in chat. If you've ever had in a, uh, in a job description, if you've ever seen it or ever had it where there's like the secret word, you know, type the secret word at the top the of little your test. He's yeah, 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 that little one. test. <laughs> oh, yeah. I do it to them. I do it to them. Uh, so Elaine, if you get on that call, and the first thing out of your mouth is not uh, my secret word or my secret little thing that I would like for you to do that will demonstrate to me that yes, you have watched through a very short, very high value video that I sent you the day before our call, then I will know whether you did your homework or not. And if you didn't, it'll probably be a pretty short call. This is very interesting. I just want to interrupt here for a second because what Evan is doing is evaluating whether they're good collaborators because every relationship with customers is a collaboration. So, and it can't be one sided. And I think a lot of times, especially when people are new in business, they're happy to get any business at all. But as we all learn, once we get going and become really proficient in our craft, that some business isn't good business and it actually distracts you from building better business with the other customer so this idea of a small test and i've seen this come up a lot with the seven figure businesses i've interviewed is things like that did you watch the one minute video it's a small thing but the customer who can't be bothered won't be able to be bothered to read the business plan that took evan's team weeks and weeks to work on to perfect um, so that's really interesting jason and patrick I remember you told me something that was kind of interesting was was that you actually met some of the clients in person and you would travel to meet them, even though you, you met them. Did? The so, wow, that's going above and beyond. But to this point of choosing the ideal clients, I mean, that 
that says a lot to me. Tell us a little bit about how you orchestrated that and what you were hoping to happen in those meetings before you engaged with them or, you know, once you engaged. Yeah, Elaine, um, can I, I just wanted to backtrack just a little bit uh, and, and, and Patrick, if you wouldn't mind expanding on, you know, us going to meet the client on our dime and kind of going above and beyond there. But, you know, I, I just, you know, Evan said some really good things about, um, you know, the client relationship. And we talked about the, you know, finding good customers and things like that. And those little small details, like watching a one minute video, but it also applies to you as a freelancer where you need to pay attention to the details um, and look at your profile as your first impression. It's, you know, and really breaking down those sections that like Pat was talking about, like a good, you know, a great headshot. So what we did was we found a photographer who specializes in exclusively headshots and we invested a little money to get some prof professional photos there. And for your bio, if you feel like that you can't articulate and represent the exact skills and problems you're trying to solve um, and speaking to your client's pain points, if you have a hard time articulating that, then hire a professional writer on Upwork to help polish that up for you. You know, just you can hire small... Evan, right? <laughs> no, no, you can't. He's too specialized. <laughs> no, we're kicking off a pro group, and, but only 50 people allowed in. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just those those small little investments can yield a lot more. Um, like Later. And and uh, Evan touched on narrowing your clients. So, you know, the way that you're going to do that as a freelancer, especially when you're first starting out, is really hustling, investing a lot of time into finding opportunities on Upwork. So, you know, I remember for the, the first year on Upwork, I was, you know, I was on there day and night. I was on the app and I was scroll like the first thing I would do when I wake up was scrolling I, um, through the job opportunities, you know, throughout the day. It was the last thing I did at night. And I wouldn't let any software related job opportunities slip through the cracks. But having said that, I was very selective because you have to make sure that you're going to just crush the job, get a five star review. And you can't just don't take on any job and get, you know, get desperate. Like just just stay focused because Absolutely those jobs. Agree those jobs that will come, you just have to be patient. You have to keep, you know, keep going through and finding those good matches because, um, and then, and then, and then going back to those, you know, finding good clients, I would, you know, you have to really embrace the bad experiences because they're going to, they're going to happen and they're going to help you understand those red flags that are later going to protect you and increase your chances of finding those high quality clients. So, um, just, um, just, Jason? Because someone asked a question about this, the bad experiences. Oh, okay. um, what, like, what would be some examples of bad experiences that might be a red flag um, that someone could experience? Yeah, so it's really the way that um, clients will like will that will treat you the way they treat you online, right? So you know, we we've, we've had we've had bad experiences where the um, the client was just completely rude to all of our team members and to the point where it stressed out our team members and gave them anxiety for like when they worked with this client. And to us, that was unacceptable. And, you know, we ultimately had to let the client go because, um, you know, we did, we want good clients because ultimately it creates a great uh, culture and atmosphere on our end because, you know, we're just working with great people, people that are, you know, know what they want. They're motivated. They're just very friendly and, and, you know, when when those bad experiences come, then and it, it impacts our team in a negative way. We just, you know, we just let those clients go and we learn from it and we try to put barriers in place to not let it happen again. Um, you know, whether that's through like like uh, clauses and legal paperwork or it's just letting them know what our expectations are up front, you know, just those just those barriers that they just vary so we can reduce the amount of um, uh, bad clients that come through, but they happen. And I think that's where we have really thrived is just embracing those experiences and looking for solutions and not focusing on that client. It's just, we we're like, okay, we see the problem and we see the problem as a growth opportunity to grow and not let it happen again. And, you know, we just focus on the solution to that problem and, and then we move on. I mean, that's, that's the only way that you're going to thrive and, and grow a business. Mm 
Mm-hmm. I want to highlight uh, something I, you just said. I would um, love to that, just jump on one one thing. Okay, I was going to call on you, Evan. So you're probably about <laughs> to say what I was about to call on you about. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So one thousand percent, like any every single person who is attending this should listen to what Jason just said. Um, learning from your experiences is so critical if you really want to succeed. Uh, Every single time I have ever had a problem, an issue, a weird situation, bad scenario, and it's gone so far as, um, let's say, I've I've been in more than one uh, dispute process, one every time, but, uh, you know, knock on wood that it doesn't happen, Um, had, you know, problematic, potentially problematic client scenarios, um, very, very occasional uh, bad review. It can happen. Your job, though, is to make sure that it doesn't happen, that you can deliver that consistently positive positive experience for as many people uh, as you want to as not just a freelancer, but as a a budding business, right? Um, And so one of the things that I have always done is whenever something goes bad or whenever something goes south or whenever a problem starts to happen, the easiest thing to do is always say, oh, well, this is just a bad client and uh, I never should have taken this job, right? That's the first thing, that's your gut reaction. But then you got to listen to the second thing, which says, I made a mistake. I what could I have foreseen? What could I have done differently? Should I have seen this coming? If so, was there a sign? And that comes back to the little like micro tests, the little micro things that you're looking for of could I have have seen this coming? And if so, was there something that I shouldn't ignore next time around? And if so, how do I cover from that? You know, how do I make sure that this doesn't happen again? Because the only one that is in the driver's seat is you. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. It's, it's really important. Yeah, you put it really well too, Evan. The only thing I'd tack onto that is, is part of the learning experience from when you do experience clients like that and always, of course, learning from your own mistakes as well. If you guys ever let a client go, don't take them back. That was our first time we ever let a client go. They begged and begged. And they're like, please, please, please. We took them back twice after we let them go the first time. We, we, we ended up firing them three times. So that oh was the gosh. first. Yeah. We, <laughs> after that, we're like, okay. Learn, right? After Never the learn. first time, it's a done deal. It's like, you know, wish you the best. But um, yeah, definitely, you know, it also lends to just really trusting your instincts. That's, that's good advice. So you're all at seven figures. And I think that's significant because a lot of people on this platform are, I, I see all of the questions coming in They're you know, they're trying to get their first job. They're in countries where they're wondering, is anybody from my country getting SEO jobs or the types of jobs that they do? And you've gone through those initial months of learning how to market yourself and getting out there and you've you've built substantial size operations where you now have teams of other freelancers that you hire on upwork to help you execute on big projects and multiple big projects and i think everybody on this call would love to be where where you are could you talk about maybe like the two or three strategies in your business that you think if, if you had to kind of cut aside all the small things, the big things you did that really moved the needle so that you had a more substantial size business. I don't, uh, Evan, you look like you have something to say on that. I want to hear from the guys first. I, I, oh, I'll you want to hear from them first? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Jason, Patrick. The first, thing that, the first thing that comes to mind for me is, Evan touched on it earlier, but, um, you know, making sure that, you are basically writing a cookbook for your business, right? Um, if you were to hand your business over to somebody else next week, you know, how would giving them as much de- detail as possible to understand how you, how you accomplish every task and every objective that your business accomplishes and really writing the recipe for success. Um, the one, one thing I say with Jason all the time is, you know, it's like, we're perfecting the recipe, we're perfecting the recipe. All right, now it's time to bake, bake some cakes. And, um, you know, once 
the time put into processes and really defining how your business does business is invaluable. It creates a lot of opportunity to scale when you have more, when you're growing your team rapidly, it really helps your team understand what they're, what, what they need to do and how they should do it. It also creates a lot of efficiency, just making sure that everything's done the same way every time. And it also, when you're doing this thing, doing things the same way every time, it also helps you hone in on those opportunities for growth, those opportunities to find your own mistakes within that recipe and correct it. Um, the other thing I would say that comes to mind, and then Jason, if you want to take another one after me, is uh, you know when you're hiring folks on Upwork and you're you know you're building your team on Upwork, if you can get those people dedicated to you with a monthly contract, right? Like where you know they're not an employee, but if they're if you can find a way, if you you find that right person and they got the right skills, you know, making sure that you, I mean. A lot of folks really benefit and provide a lot more focus when they're only focused on you. Um, so having folks that are really just paying attention to you, if you have the room for their entire bandwidth, is is another key to success, I'd say, as well. That's a good point because everybody's got to pay the bills. And so if you're yeah. the recurring payment that pays their rent or their mortgage or their grocery bill, you're going to come first when, you, when you're hiring talent. Um, in terms of standing out, I, because I think this is one of the critical things, You, once you get established, it's easier to stand out, but there's a lot of questions pouring in from people who are saying, you know, what, what are the secrets to SEO on Upwork, or you know, how do I stand out from the crowd, or other people are charging $3 an hour and I have to charge a lot more than that. Do you have a, like a general thought on that, that that you can advise them so that they I, you're all charging premium prices you're working with really great clients and you've earned that by becoming extremely proficient in what you do but there's a little more to it in terms of the visibility um do you want to yeah. share on that jason sure so uh, you know i would say that don't focus on what other people are charging don't undervalue yourself if you undervalue your work, then the money that you earn during your busy periods won't last during the slow ones. And when when someone's paying for you, you got to remember that when someone's paying for your skills, they're not just paying for the time and effort it takes to complete the job. They're also paying for the time and experience it took to build up those skills to to the level that they're at. And so it's just it's it's really important not to focus on that. You know. Um, just uh, when I'm when I'm hiring freelancers, I'm looking for that confidence of how they can solve my problem. I'm not I'm not paying attention to the prices. I'm not looking for like a cheap deal or anything like that. And um, that's a good way to find bad clients, too, who are trying, you know, if they're asking you like they keep asking you to, you know, significantly reduce your price or something like that. Um, you, ju you just want to stand your ground on what you feel like that you're worth, because that will also enable you to get more of those high quality clients who aren't just looking for a deal, a cheap price. They're just looking to, they're just trying to find that confidence that you can do the job um, that they need to be, you know, the problem that they need solved. So. And some, some clients are actually turned off by a price if it's too low. Um, you know, it's the best ones, I, I would argue. So yeah. something to keep in mind, guys. Thousand percent so, agree with that. The person, oh, go ahead, I, Evan. I was going to say when you like back to the stage where you were when you had a baby to feed, it's harder to say no to certain clients, and there is sort of a feeling of adrenaline, you know, that you do have to get some revenue coming into the business for the people that are in that stage of their business. They should hold their ground. They should defend their prices. We is there sort of a middle ground on this in the beginning where? people can maybe take some clients that aren't the perfect ones. What, what is your philosophy on that? Mm, mm, okay, so this is where Evan's strong opinions uh, really, really come out. <laughs> uh, so I, you talk about adrenaline. I still remember the exact feeling that I got when I had my first $80 an hour offer. I still remember the exact feeling that I got when I got my first hundred dollar an hour offer. I'm not saying like when, when the money came in, crazy thing is when the money comes in, you've already put in the work, 
and you kind of feel nothing. But when you get the offer, that's big. And so I remember this vividly um, because at the time I needed it. And the first $80 an hour offer that I got, <laughs> disaster. I never should have taken this client on. Um, it, it was a bad idea from the start. Could have seen it coming. Absolutely very clear signs. Um, and it was a big mistake on my part. I, and, and that's, uh, I, I, I'm interested to hear Jason and, and, and Patrick, like what your experience was, because, uh, especially in the early days, like that's when I was making the most mistakes. It was, uh, you have to be under, like, as you grow, you have to be understanding that you're, you are in the process of growth and you're going to make those mistakes. Expectations of clients are going to continue to accelerate and maybe beyond your control as you grow. And you might not necessarily be able to control those expectations effectively enough until you've got really enough experience under your belt. Maybe it was just, I, I grew too fast, but uh, I, I know that um, with with those early projects uh it was you have to be willing to bend over backwards to to do a little bit of work that is unpaid uh you have to be very very accommodating because otherwise the, your much bigger problem is going to happen uh you either sacrifice a little bit of money or you sacrifice a lot of growth and speed of that growth uh there is no way that I would have grown uh, uh, earnings as fast if I had, you know, just insisted on things and uh, pushed back really hard on clients when they wanted extra work done uh, and, and not just like gone the extra mile for people. Uh, it, it would have been very, very problematic uh, and probably would have stopped me in my tracks uh, if I wasn't extremely cognizant of the fact like, I want to keep this to to keep going and growing, so I can't let, you know, one relatively smaller issue, even if it's a headache this week, I can't let that slow me down or stop me. And then I just want to remind you of something you told me in Tiny Business Big Money. Your first year, you brought in one hundred and seven thousand. The second year, four hundred thirty-eight thousand. The third year, one point. 2 million. You can read it on page 164. It's, it's stuck in my mind because it, it had, you had exponential growth and those things that you do the first year multiply your revenue in the future years. So sometimes Very much so. it's, it, there's an investment of time in, and in the learning curve in the beginning that will pay off, but it just doesn't pay off immediately. And I think that's important for people to realize, because when I looked at the num numbers, I thought, wow, um, there, I, I see Will there, and I know it's time for our Q and A. And there's actually a really great question here that I wanted to ask you from Dalibor. Um, in what moment did you decide to convert from solo freelancing to agency at Upwork, and what was the crucial element to decide? I think that's a really interesting one because when I did I did a survey in Tiny Business Big Money of all of the seven figure entrepreneurs, 100% use contractors. So I think that's significant, very significant, because you, you, there's only so much one person can do, right? And I think as solopreneurs, a lot of us tend to hold on to every project. We think we're the only one who can do it. And then we reach our breaking point one day, we have to outsource something, and then it's much easier than we think. And you have really mastered it. I mean, the numbers of people you're now working with on your team is, is incredible. But maybe you could speak to that, Evan. You know, did you have... With the business plans, I remember you, you know you were doing them yourself, and then you brought in a designer, I think, next or a writer. I, I forget the order, but you realized to have a certain level of quality, you needed other people involved mm -hmm. in the team. Yeah, one of the important things that as you grow, you're gonna, and I'm sure that that, that Jason and Patrick have seen the exact same thing. Uh, there's going to be diminishing returns on what you can actually deliver, as a a solo freelancer. Um, I got the question, you know, 
probably on the last panel uh, that we were on together uh, about, you know, do you run as a as a solo in, individual or do you have a team? And like all caps, my response is team. Uh, I had never had any designs, even from the first day that I took my first job uh, on Upwork. I never had a, a, a dream of I'm going to be the biggest and best freelancer. My one of my dreams was I'm going to build something bigger than myself and build a business out of this. And so that was really the, the, the goal of things. Uh, so yeah, as, as you go along, um, the simplest way that I can put it is when you diagram out all those uh, steps of your business, like, um, like, uh, I believe Patrick, you were, you were talking about of, um, every, every step of the process and what you do and what happens when, uh, and how you can strive for efficiencies in that process and make it just so streamlined and so easy from the client's perspective. Uh, that's where you can start identifying, okay, Hey, maybe there's somebody who's better than me at this step of the process or that step of the process. And then the hard part comes in when you are consciously saying, I'm not the best at this and I need somebody else you do still need to train that person to be better within the context of your process than you. So you got to get better at the job in order to be able to explain exactly what you need done uh, for the person that you're going to hire. So yeah, it's a, That's very it's a learning growing it, process. Well, it's also, I think, um, important in client communication because one thing that has stood out for me, I've spoken with all of you multiple times is you're great communicators and you're very clear and when a client asks you, you know, what are what is the process of putting together a business plan? You could send them that document that you give to the employees if you wanted to, but you can explain it clearly. And I think part of client communication is being able to set expectations around, you know, this part of the project takes this many weeks and, you know, someone needs to review it. And then we'll get back to you on this date and we'll show you X, Y, or Z. I think that's that's very important. Jason and Patrick, you had two people, so you had more people available to do the work, but even two people can run out of time. And um, I know there's been a big inspiration among a lot of the smaller businesses in Tim Ferriss and the four hour work week. And he always talks about don't trade time for dollars. And um, you kind of got out of that and you're very project based and agency based. Tell, tell us a little bit about your, you know, that point where you decided to go in that direction of being more entrepreneurial within Upwork. Sure. Yeah. So really it was, I mean, it's same as Evan, basically from the first project, we had aspirations to build a business and build a team. Um, we did complete the first project ourselves, but, um, you know, software projects and building applications can take up a lot of time, like you said, uh, Elaine and, um, so we were we were on the lookout for expanding our team during in the middle of our first project um, and looking for how a few things like how can we find people to Evan's point that are even better than us right I'm proud of my skills I'm proud of Jason's skills but there's always someone better right so how can we find people that are even better than we are to do the job that we're doing but also how can we you know build you know, thinking of things as a sales pipeline, right? Everyone that's attending, like you have your sales pipeline, thinking of it as a, as a physical pipe, you know, the more people you have in your team, the bigger that pipe gets. And you always want to be thinking of not how many, not how many projects can I, can I fit through that pipe in a reasonable manner? You want to be stuffing that pipe. So it's overflowing all the time. And that will create the impetus for you to expand your pipe. And, and, there's going to be a fear of that at first. And, um, you know, you're going to be thinking, oh, well, you know, I don't know. I don't want things to get carried away, but really, you know, to the point so of going, push it till it breaks, baby, push it till it breaks. Yeah. And really, I mean, you know, obviously like processes and things like that, standards for your company that really helps you scale, you know, the bake in the cake analogy, right? You have the recipe, you can hand that recipe to another baker and they're going to bake the same cake you just baked, but really thinking of it, guys like don't if you're not moving forward you're moving backwards and you don't even realize it 
So you always want to be growing. You always want to be expanding and it's going to be terrifying sometimes. But that's like some of the best advice I could give anybody attending this call is that push as hard as you can for as long as you can, as consistently as you can. Um, and the earlier you start from project one or project five, the better. And do you think your ultra marathoning has helped you to expand your capacity? I ask this just because I noticed in the survey of the seven figure entrepreneurs, 88% exercise. And I do feel that there are certain ways you can discipline your mind when you're challenging yourself. You could go into anxiety, panic, and fear, or you can, you know, kind of throw down the gauntlet to yourself and challenge yourself and view it as more of a fun thing of growing your business. And we all control our mindset. So I, you know, I, I don't know, Patrick, do you, it, it, like, how do you frame it in your mind so that you don't totally freak out when the pipe is about to explode? That's a great, that's a great question. So, um, the main, I'd say in a sentence, focus on what you can control and not on what you cannot, right? So focus on the variables that you can change and not the static ones to use a programming reference. The, you know, really focusing on, you know, the lowest hanging fruit, what provides the most value and just putting blinders on. The other, the other aspect of that I'd say is understanding that, you know, you, Throughout this process, guys, your business is going to grow, but you yourself as a person and a business leader are going to grow as well. So always looking for ways to improve yourself, your mindset through meditation, whether it's through exercise, through seeing how, how far and hard you can push yourself. Um, they're all really, really valuable things to pay attention to there. And just realizing that it all pays off in the end. You're building a dream. These Working for other people, you know, there's a lot of well-paid people that work for companies out there, but working for yourself is what I would easily vote and tell my children that is the easiest path to success. And Upwork's a great way to do that. Agreed. I can yeah. jump in here and 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 I'm gonna third that and say uh, two other people in my family uh, are have made a hundred thousand plus on Upwork. Uh, and a third person is probably at 50,000 so far. So yeah, uh, th three totally different spaces. And yeah, it's a fantastic place. Uh, I mean, just do good and deliver awesome results, right? Always it's incredible, uh, you know, that up, I, I, because I remember when Upwork was Odesk and Elance and it, it really has made freelancing available to people around the world. And there was a world before this where it was so much harder to reach clients. It's challenge, I mean, it's very competitive because you have a lot of people on the platform, um, but at the same time, it's a possibility if you learn how to master it. There, there's a really good question here from um, Giovanni. He said, how can I get my projects discovered when my competitors are charging a third of my prices in the same site. And I, I think we haven't totally dived into the- I've got an answer SEO for that. Of this whole thing. Yeah. Do we want uh, to talk about that a little? Can I, can I, can I take this one guys? Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Um, first and foremost, SEO on uh, Upwork, non-existent. You, you, you won't be able to, to, to do it. Um, I've spoken with the tech team. It's just like with Google, uh, where you may or may not know, it is localized to your own profile, the results that you're going to see. So just because somebody is a, uh, you know, a superstar client, uh, doesn't mean that if you put like some special words or something that in your profile that you are going to be seen and you're going to appear as number one, because if I search right now for not mm, let's say m ms right and jason searches for m ms we're going to get two totally different sets of results right and if we're searching in google uh same thing with upwork and you can't beat it but you can consistently win uh so trying to go at it as an seo game doesn't work like that unfortunately what does work, however, is consistently raising your rate, uh, delivering awesome results, uh, consistently getting five-star reviews, uh, and doing great work with, with clients. That's how you will consistently find your way to the top and in front of clients with larger budgets that are hiring for 
uh, higher rates, et cetera. Um, that is criteria that filters into uh, the selection algorithm of what is going to rank you higher or lower. One of those pieces of information that is being judged is, let's say the, the client's average spend and average project size, et cetera. So if you are a freelancer that does big projects, then you're going to be shown more likely to clients with big budgets that have a history of doing big projects. So the answer is try and do big projects as quickly as you can, because then you will rank in front of people who are looking to hire people for, for big projects and have a history of oh, doing so. That, that, that alone is, that's, that's like, that will help a lot of people on this call. Yeah, I most people don't know this. Their revenues. So, so Shrook has asked, how can I convince my first client to work with me when I don't even have any ratings yet on my profile? Um, do, do you have any shortcut for somebody to get at least one project so that they can get a rating? I would say it comes down to your availability to do it in a timely manner. Got to remember people on Upwork are ready to buy. They're ready to solve this problem right now. So doing that, uh, you know, reassuring them that you can get this done in a short amount of time and with high quality work is, um, is key. And also, again, that that confidence. I mean, you have to express that confidence. Um, again, don't go, don't shoot just for, hey, I'll do this for a good deal. I'll lower my price. Just just, you know, give them an example of how you're going to solve this problem and say you're going to solve this problem within this amount of time and and really focus on just just that confidence. Again, you got to be confident that you're going to get this done for them. You're going to make this a very high quality, successful project in, uh, in a reasonable amount of time and do that over and over and over again. Again, you have to you're going to, you know, especially when you're first starting out, you're going to have to invest a lot of time seeking out opportunities. Don't spam like we talked about at the beginning. Take your time to write, customize emails. And, and it's interesting because I remember like, I remember these feelings, especially at the beginning where it's like, I know I'm going to get this project. Like this is, this is like written for me. You have to take, you have to take that approach with everything like at the beginning. I mean, as long as you get like, actually get that feeling, it's just like, this person's writing this for me. This is, this is my job. And so I will, I would sit there and I would compose a proposal or bid that, you know, that um, addressed the problem that they're needing to solve, how I was going to do it. And, and the confidence just kind of comes out when you know that you can crush this particular job opportunity. But, but the thing is, is a lot of people just try to do it in quantities, like, like a, like a mass cold email or something like that. And I will tell you that it never doing, works. It's not going to work because by now, I mean, especially the people that have been on Upwork for a long time, I mean, they could sniff out those those copy pasted emails immediately. So you have yeah. you have 230 characters, give or take, for um, in your cover letter to show potential clients that you know this is a customized email. Get straight to the point and let them know how you're going to solve their problem within those first two sentences. Otherwise, they're just going to skip over your your bid um, because. You know, when when you're a client, you see a massive list of you know. Dear sir slash madam. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, 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 nope. Seriously, like you you see it all the time, and so you can you can see immediately if it's a if it's like a heartfelt like customized um, proposal, and those are the ones that I can just see immediately, and I'll open up their profile, which is step two, and then I'll start looking at their other details, maybe their past experiences. And I've hired hundreds, literally hundreds of freelancers on Upwork. And so I, I and the people that I hire are, don't necessarily have like, you know, like past experiences or reviews or things like that. I just felt comfortable with their words. They used their words. We took Absolutely the next right. step and had a discovery call. Uh, they were, you know, very professional. They had a professional presence about them on the video call. And they were just like, I could do this for you. I'm going to do it for you like this. And I'm going to do it for you in this amount of time. Boom. I'm like, okay, hire. Like, I would and be interested to know, Jason, um, because from 
the hires that I've made, and I, I haven't made hundreds, but I've made definitely dozens in, you know, I'm probably halfway there. Um, some of the best hires that I've ever made are people who actually had no track record at all on Upwork, uh, but just did a really good job of uh, differentiating themselves, demonstrating that they could do the job. Uh, paying attention more than more than others. Uh, those were my best hires. And that includes one person that made over a half a million dollars. So that's a wow. thing. It, that exists. Well, and so Evan, let's, exist. let's unpack that a little bit because there's a lot of questions from people who are saying they have no experience. How do they stand out? So for if you could think back to that hire who made over half a million dollars, what were the things about this person, you know, in the email that just those little details that stood out for you that you oh, would give a chance and maybe somebody else wouldn't get a chance? Yeah. So a um, couple things to, to preface this, and I want to come back to, to, to that, um, but just to say uh, to the previous question about competition as it relates to everybody else that's out there, like you see maybe you know, 20 to 50 proposals or something like that. Okay, if there's 20 to 50 proposals, odds are between 60 and 70% are total copy paste and not worth anything. So you're not competing really with too many people. Even if you think you are, you're not because way too many people are phoning it in. Uh, so competition is far lower than you think. Doesn't get you out of the woods though. Uh, so what, what does the... Um, what makes for the person that gets hired for the the job that turns into a, a good job that turns into a really fantastic job uh, and makes a lot of money with um granted understand over the course of multiple years okay not like in one year but uh over the course of multiple years yeah half a million dollars um what got the job done was a very cleverly written proposal that followed the rules that uh, demonstrated not even like clear e experience in the space that I was looking for, but that connected th their their uh, other experience from a totally different job and wove it in to what I needed for that role. And I spoke with probably a dozen people and none of them really just like resonated. This person was new on Upwork. I think it was the second job that he, that he ever took on. Pretty good freaking second job, if I would say so. Um, but it was taking their experience and uh, even such that it was totally different to, to what was needed for this role, but making it uh, clearly linked with this is, I can do what you need and here's evidence of me doing what you need in the context of this proposal, which was wild, which was impressive, which was different, which was above and beyond. And that's the sort of person that I needed, someone who can demonstrate uh, the, the, the things that are needed uh, without just saying like, oh yeah, you know, I can do it, I can do it. It's I'm showing you that I'm doing it live. That's next level stuff. And so oh, that's really good. That's really, really good advice. Impressive. And I, I would imagine that the questions that they ask you, someone, uh, Jonathan had asked about what happens if the job post isn't detailed. And I think this applies on or off Upwork. A lot of times the client says they want this, but you really, they're not very specific about it can they communicate with you in a way that will make you more likely to hire them in asking the question if you know, i'm saying like it is the way they ask for more information a, a place where they can signal to you that they're competent i'd say that oh yeah. yeah ask good questions you'll you'll get jobs yeah 100 yeah. percent. yeah and, and what, would, what would what would be a good question that someone could ask you if they like you were looking for help with an app, for instance. For an app, so if, if we're looking for an app, 
um, certainly what, you know, asking great questions about the details of the project um, and not just, not just saying yes, yes, yes. Right. And, and the way we look for hires is we follow the hungry, humble, smart methodology, which also lends to, you know, you can be very successful on Upwork if you don't have a lot of, a lot of profile experience on Upwork. I mean, most of those people are going to be hungry. They're going to be ready to go. They're going to add fuel to that jet that you're trying to build or that rocket. Right. And then, you know, the, the humble piece is, is, is speaking about, you know, they're not just saying, yes, I can do this. Yes, I can do that. Um, and, you know, really giving honest answers about what they can do and what they cannot do. So one of the, one of the key indicators to me that I'm speaking with somebody that I can trust, somebody that has talent and somebody that's confident in their skills is when they tell me they cannot do something. Um, when I said, you know, if we're talking about a specific programming framework or things like that. Um, and then the smart piece, hungry, humble, smart, back to the smart piece, questions are extremely, in my opinion, they're an extremely telling indicator of intelligence. Um, yes. they, agree, they, hard they, agree. They really help you look into the thought process of the individual you're interviewing. They really, you get to see inside their mind and then how they think. Um, which is a big part of uh, being successful in any any role. Um, so specifically about applications, I would you know say somebody that really digs into the details and the requirements, um, and and looks for those gaps in information that I'm providing, and and hones in on that. Um, but overall, uh, yeah. Can I try can to we... ask you a good question? If I'm on the other side of that table from you, and you're hiring for this sort of role, Patrick. Please. Can I take his crack on? All right. Um, what if, all right. So you, you, you need to build an app. Is that right? Yep. Is that the, okay. All right. Um, are there any specific architectural necessities that we're going to need in order to accomplish specific goals in the UI, uh, experience? Exactly. Yep. Yeah, oh, that was a good one, Evan. That's a great question. And that's actually what I was going to say next is that understanding. So at, one of the best questions to ask is how do you define success? How can I make sure that I am going to be successful after you hire me? For sure. I would agree. That's a, an excellent, excellent question. So, so generally speaking, Emily asks, is it better to ask extra questions about a project to show interest? It sounds like asking at least a few gets a dialogue going. Oh, with the a thousand percent. You do not want to, when, when the interviewer asks if you have any questions and you say, no, I'm, if that happens to me, I'm turned off immediately. Can you uh, tell if this person isn't thinking, maybe they don't care. Maybe they're checked out. Um, questions really help you understand how that person's mind works. Always ask questions guys. And can I, Elaine, before, you know, before we run out of time here, something that I think is super important to, building a successful business on Upwork is to really treat Upwork as a serious business partner. You got to think of them as your marketing and sales team extension. Um, yeah. Understand they're bringing you a consistent stream of opportunities from people. Like I said earlier, they're ready to buy and they're doing this and Upwork's doing this on a daily basis. And if you had a business partner, you wouldn't intentionally break the contract or in this case, the terms of service. If, if Upwork is the one that facilitated the opportunity, then the business and the financial transactions should stay on the platform. Don't try to go off the platform. Um, they're your business partner that you're, you're under contract with them. Think about, think about how much it would cost to hire a marketing and sales employee to bring in those types and amounts of opportunities of I mean, warm leads that are highly qualified inbound. Right. <laughs> yeah, good luck, right? I mean, so Upwork fees are nominal compared to the salary and commission. If you And if you do just happen to find somebody that will work 100% commission from you, you'll end up paying them more than you would Upwork. So if you stay true and honest to your business partner, great things will come out of it. That's yeah. really a good point, Jason, because how you treat one business partner is really how you're going to treat all of them and holding yourself to a very high standard of how you interact only yeah. serves you well going mm. going forward. 
Um, yeah. I'd build on that even. I would go so far as to say, like, you know, Jason mentioned, uh, and, and then I look at it in the same way of like, where else are you going to find such cheap leads? Now, the key is get from, you know, the sub $500 price point uh, for any given project or any given niche north of 10,000 as quickly as you can so that it's as worth it as it can be for you to take on that individual project. Uh, but considering like if, if, if you look around as a, as a freelancer, uh, especially if you're early in your journey or you're, you're midway and still growing, you can look around and see that, you know, the people that are, are here, uh, on this webinar are not the only ones that have been, I would just go ahead and say wildly successful on Upwork. There are more people like us, right? So considering that that is, you know, not just like a one-off fluke, that this is possible, that there's even a process that you can go through to get there, considering that this is the scale and level that you can get to, uh, and I'm sure that you guys have a big roaring business off of Upwork as well, uh, just, you know, leads are naturally going to come in. Um, considering all that's at stake, why would you ever break the terms of, of service? And, and why would you, like, Upwork's your best friend, my guy. <laughs> I'm tacking on. I'm tacking on. So good. Uh, so we're all we're, we're talking about you know working building agencies and working with other contractors through Upwork, right? You are contracting with Upwork. Upwork is the most powerful contractor you could have on your team. It's you know we think of it as a company, but you are you basically you are contracting an entire company that provides this amazing service to you. So it's really no different than hiring. A contractor that you found on Upwork to do marketing and sales for you, but it's much bigger than that. It's very exponential in that sense. It's if it's, you're contracting, you're contracting with Upwork. It's no different. Well, yeah, it's it's like a salesperson on commission, basically. If you were to yep. somehow not pay them their commission, would they want to sell for you again? Probably not. Um, there's it's an interesting question from Majid here um, about: Is it better to send in detail what you can do in the proposal or show other similar projects to illustrate it or both. We're talking about in terms of someone who wants to get to your level on the platform, best practices for you know, being a better entrepreneur. What what would you recommend? I got one if, if you guys, I want to hear you guys uh, input on this. One of the craziest and weirdest, I don't know why this is a thing, but uh, I imagine you see the exact same thing. Industry. Industry plays. If you have done something in that person's industry and is, that is just similar enough or close enough in that industry, even such that uh, what you do, I imagine it, it it's kind of applies across industries, right? It's not like you just do a single industry worth of jobs, right? You address multiple industries. However, for what I have experienced, there is a major hot button uh, for if you have done something in a similar industry to the, to the one that the client is in, then you are head and shoulders above anybody else uh, that would be equivalent without it. Uh, and it can actually win you the job. Thoughts? And so how do you drop that into the conversation, Evan? Like, is it when I th did my last consumer packaged goods proposal, I did X, Y, and Z, or, you know, how, how do you do that? Elaine, dear, or hello, Elaine. Would you be interested to know that I have worked with a client that is extremely similar to your business uh, in your space? A little bit, a little bit of a, a twist, and not exactly what you do, but I know the story. I know what um, what you're. I I have a pretty good idea of what it is that you're going to need in in this project. But I'd love to discuss it with you further to get a better handle on it. My key questions would be: Good question one, good question two, good question three. Let's hop on a call. Uh, 
shoot me a message and we'll organize. I mean, oh, that was good. I, I, I've I'm done this before. <laughs> there is a recording, right, Will? Because there's a lot of like really good nuggets here that I think if people took these away and and started applying them, they would really see the kind of exponential results that you've seen, but, you know, based on whatever base they're starting from. Uh, Rizwan asked, what do you think about the exclusive agency contract? Is it a good choice to accept one if you are doing well as an independent freelancer? Is it more like a job rather than an independent earner? That's a good question because we're talking about thinking entrepreneurially about your freelance career and there are people along the whole spectrum from people almost replicating a job for themselves to people that want to really grow and see how far they can take it and break the pipe open. Um, what do you recommend about that type of contract? I'd say it really depends on what your goals are. If your goals are to create your own agency, then no, it's probably not the best fit for you. If your goal is to build a profile in Upwork with great experience, get some, you know, some project examples behind you, um, then yeah, it could be the right, it could be the right goal for maybe that step one while you build your profile. And then if you want to be an agency later, step two, create your own agency. Um, but, you know, it's, it also takes that, you know, what we talked about earlier, it really takes that free sales team for you to another level, right? Where you have Upwork and then you have the agency that you're attached to pitching as many jobs as they can on Upwork. And then if you're a developer, you know, it's great because you just get hand, handed project after project after project. You can focus on what you love to do and you don't have to focus on sales so much. So I'd really say it really depends on what your goals are. Yeah, just really assess, you know, like just sit down and really think through what are your goals and what, you know, you have your goal and then what are the objectives that it's going to take to get me to that goal and um, and really have that, you know, think through that process. And if and if one of those objectives aligns with attaching to an ex, in a, to an agency exclusively, then go for it. If if you feel, you know, or maybe you just need a break and, and you need some steady income because of some, you know, personal personal arrangement or something like that, then, you know, you could jump on this for a little bit and then, and, and then get back to it when you feel refreshed. I mean, yeah, just, it could be part of your strategy, um, to, you know, to build up your profile. So I would say That's that, really can, can I jump on, on this one? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> strong opinions incoming again, um, just from experience. Uh, I find that we tend to put ourselves into one of two buckets and I don't know where you guys fit into, um, but I know which one I fit in the buckets being, I like to sell and I'm good at sales. I'm good at bringing in new clients. Uh, and the other bucket being, I don't like to sell and I'm not really that good at bringing in clients. Um, uh, on Upwork, that's where, uh, I found this with 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 my sister in particular because uh, she is she's an excellent creative. She's a designer, graphic designer, very very talented. Despises selling, really doesn't like to uh, you know toot her own horn. Doesn't like to you know put herself out there and say like yeah, I am definitively the best. I've worked with Ford. I've worked with Verizon. I've worked with incredible like doesn't like to sing her own praises even such that she has this fantastic track record uh, and is just not interested in um, actively engaging in sales. Uh, myself, I also don't like, like contrary to what anybody here th probably thinks, I don't like sales. I am not good at sales. I'm actually terrible as a salesperson. So in spite of me being terrible, uh, I'm like lucky that, that, that I've gotten I to like the point. those little comments coming through. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's written all over space. Uh, so I find that that people generally fall into those uh, two buckets. So it, I can say that if you are if you feel that you're not good at sales, you can get better. You're not going to ever turn yourself from a, an introvert to an extrovert. It's just not going to happen and you should only be how you are naturally you can still get good at sales even if you don't like it uh you can sell by not selling uh so there is a pathway for you there 
but I find that some some people that would be much better off by just doing a little bit of, of sales training and getting a little bit better at it themselves, uh, they end up going the direction of uh, the agency route because in, in that respect, they don't necessarily have to sell. They get to you know sort of relax um, into uh, their, their space and their job. Uh, and some people just want that. Um, and uh, I'm not saying you know that that's a bad thing or, or it's a good thing. Uh, but the opportunity is there if you're if you're interested and uh, willing to step a little bit outside of your com comfort zone, like 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 I have, I guess, uh, and do a little bit of training on that front. Uh, you have the opportunity to be able to do that, and it's not like you have to sit back and say, "Oh, I'm just the technical person and I can't relate to other people. I can't seal deals. I can't." get contracts in beyond just like an agency relationship. That's, uh, that's very inspiring. Evan Shiva actually was responding to what you said. What are some good ways to learn how to sell? And I mean, what you what, what I hear you saying is maybe there's a, a, a sort of a framework you can have in your mind that even if you hate to sell, maybe there are certain points you can cover with everybody and get more comfortable. Mm -hmm. with it is there sort of a template out there like a mental template people can learn from or anybody like whose youtube videos you like or i mean I, of course <laughs> oh you are well so, good um so, we should look up evan because he is well despite uh him saying that he's not good at selling i notice a few people in the audience don't believe this so <laughs> and that's and that's perfectly that's, fine and probably uh, you know they're me. they're probably more um, right than me um well, um, but, but yes, to your point, um, you you can learn how to sell by by let's say not sell. I don't know. It's it's weird to explain, but um, for example, hard sell. I could never do that. I could never do the whole Jordan Belfort like you know buy now sort of thing because that actually is super counterproductive uh, on Upwork. And if I ever did that, uh, I would be getting one stars all day long because I am taking on clients that maybe I shouldn't have sold in the first place. That's actually the biggest power uh, or not. Uh, it's like the, 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 the weirdest thing to understand. It's far more important to, to just speak to a lot of people, but be very, very good at vetting and gently saying no, uh, than it is to, uh, to, to take on like a bunch of work on Upwork. It will very quickly become about what you say no to and why and how frequently you can say no than, uh, than anything about the jobs that you do take on. I would be interested to hear Jason and, and Patrick's take now that I've you know taken up the whole freaking. Well, there's no, word I... of mouth, right? Jason, I mean, you, you guys have built such good relationships with, and I, I know you have too, Evan, like when you work with a high caliber client, who are their friends, high caliber people? So yeah. when they say, Oh, who did your pitch deck that went in front of SoftBank or, you know, who, who did that app? They probably tell each other, which is really selling without selling. So when you become so proficient at what you do that people, maybe you don't even have to ask them to put up a five-star review. You guys get a lot of I'm referrals? Happy. Pardon me? Uh, I was asking Jason and, and Patrick, do you guys get a lot of referral business nowadays? We do. Yeah, it's nice. The nicest is when uh, we get a referral that's a company all on its own that has many clients in itself, and then we provide the services for that company. That's when things can get really exponential. Yeah, and I think it's not so much about you know going back to the selling without selling. I mean, it's not so much, you, if you don't like just don't look at it so much as selling. Look at it more of just communication and being able to communicate your points and getting that across. I mean, for example. Uh, Patrick and I, we're always looking to grow and um, getting out of our comfort zone and kind of circling back to what you said previously, you know, uh, uh, Elaine about it, be, you know, if exercise helps. I don't, you know, it's not so much that while, yes, I think it does help, but it's more of just that mentality of be, not being uh, or just not getting comfortable, you know, keep, and, and keep putting yourselves in situations where you know, that like tough situations and, and things like that. So I, you know, earlier on, we, 
uh, I was very uncomfortable talking in front of more than one or two people. And so it's just like, okay, what, what can I do to overcome that? Well, obviously the answer is do it more. And so we went to like Toastmasters, for example, and, you know, I was put in some very awkward situations in front of a lot of people um, and, and just getting into that uncomfortable zone. But eventually, you know, like you start training your mind to be okay with that. And, and if, you know, whatever will be an uncomfortable. What's that? Get com get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah, exactly. Oh it's a life. God. It's a lifelong journey. I mean, that's. Oh, it's so true, and you can do it outside of, um, outside of your work too. Like I do martial arts with my daughters, and I remember having to be, in my first fight in front of all these people in my community, and. <laughs> I can't tell you the impact it had on my business because it was just, I was freaking out so badly beforehand. Um, and then just having done it, it wasn't like I was, you know, in the ring with Muhammad Ali or anything, but, but putting yourself out of your comfort zone, whether it's a sport a social situation, anything, I think expands your capacity and the Toastmasters is a wonderful group. And there are a lot of free resources oh, yeah. for people that are on a shoestring budget starting their business. There's so many free things, you know, online all over the place now that you can become more proficient. And I think the bottom line is these entrepreneurs have really taken the time to become very good at every aspect of their business, not only the actual project work, but also the other things like the client communication, the presentation of their profile on Upwork, um, you know, um, the financial side of the business, the compliance side of following the rules of the platforms that they use, et cetera. They've really devoted themselves to growth as entrepreneurs and really taken ownership of their own careers. And I, I, I see that as something that really takes businesses to the next level. It's not simply just getting the next project on Upwork and how many projects can you get and can you get your rate a little bit higher. It's a, it's a much bigger picture look at your business as part of your life and what, what you're doing with your time on earth. And, um, you know, it's, it's very inspiring where, of course, we always run out of time. They, these guys know me and they know the interviews always go to like the five hour, five part mini series. But since we don't have that today, could you each maybe take a minute or two just to give us some parting words um, to inspire all these hundreds of people who are still on here, inspired to take their business to the next level? Sure. Kevin? Yeah, I'll go or, first. Oh, okay, Patrick. Okay, thank yeah, you. The, He's I might have here, right? <laughs> right. Because yeah, I do have a I do have a call coming up in two minutes. But uh, so really, guys, uh, to tack on to what Elaine was saying, if you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards, and you don't realize it. it as a person and a, and as a business, don't be comfortable being uncomfortable. Like Evan said, always push forward, never stop, um, and just really. Every time you think that you should just kind of pause and just hold steady, get get that thought out of your head, overstuff the sales pipe, just keep going. You know, you might get frustrated, but eventually it's going to stick and you're, you'll grow exponentially. Well, thank you for that. Uh, Jason? Yeah, just know, you know, know what you want to do. Again, plan and assess. What, what is it like really dig down deep? and and dream big i mean like there's you know sky's the limit you know all this stuff is cliche but it's true it's just dig deep figure out exactly like what you, where you really see yourself in five ten years from now and and then take those steps daily um even outside of work you know uh just just whatever it is to make you more a more well-rounded person and and just progress a little by little inch by inch day by day to and then ultimately you will reach that goal but don't focus too much on the goal itself and become overwhelmed with that and feel like you're not going anywhere focus on the day-to-day -day and now that you already know what that goal is uh, that i i love that mindset of day by day because some of these goals are really lofty and evan so mine is going to be far less prescient than 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 jason uh if i had to nail it down to one thing, it would be consistency um, and persistence. So the two biggest barriers in the early days for everybody. And as you grow, it'll become more and more. 
uh, consistency and, and persistence. Um, so consistency in the results that you're delivering, consistently getting better, uh, being persistent in always trying to uh, one up yourself and understand that the only person that you're truly competing with is who you were yesterday. And as long as you're getting one to 2% better every single day, then yeah, you are, you're winning and you're winning big Perfect. and oh, I... the growth is incredible. Um, and also I, I have to uh, give a, a shameless pump. Uh, I dropped a, a couple of links in the chat. Uh, we, if you, if you want to do those things and, and continue to get better, if you're early on in, in your journey, then uh, there's a free community that uh, we just kicked off. And if you're later on in your journey and already, you know, doing really well and want to accelerate, hit that exponential growth, then um, we have a pro group. So well, that's fantastic. thank you all. Um, and please pass along our thanks to Patrick. I know I ran over a little bit, Jason. And <laughs> I'm just so moved by all these people just so committed to growing their businesses and building better lives for themselves and their families and their communities. This is wonderful. And thank you to Upwork. I'm going to turn it over to Will now and um, really invite you all. Um, you know, I'm sure everyone here on this panel would welcome you following them on their social media. If you have additional questions, I see great questions pouring in. Um, we're, we're all on LinkedIn and everywhere else. So you, you can find Absolutely. us easily. Uh, over to you, Will. Thank you so much. This has been a, a fantastic event. Uh, amazing insights. Thank you so much to each of you for participating. If you wouldn't mind, if you have any links you'd like to drop in the chat, Evan, I know you've got a, a few links that put up there. Elaine, I know you've got a, a, a cool new book out recently, which I think most of the people in this presentation are actually in that book. So please drop they those are. links, both, um, fantastic <laughs> information. Yeah. Now, um, uh, folks on this event, uh, a recording will be available. I've dropped the link a few times in the chat there. Oh, there's the book oh, itself. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done, Evan. And uh, look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you so much. Thanks, Will. Thank Thanks, Evan. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, Jason. Thank, pa thank Patrick. Bye, everyone. Me.